Muito bem, estamos ao vivo, mais uma live aqui no canal, hoje é terça-feira, dia 31 de março, esta é uma live especial, eu já vou falar apenas em português estas frases, pessoal que ainda não se inscreveu no canal, se inscrever, ativar o sininho, entrar no nosso canal Telegram, e a partir de agora será em inglês, as legendas seguirão depois da transmissão, possivelmente no final do dia de hoje ou amanhã, as legendas em inglês. All right, so this is all uh, that I'm going to say in Portuguese. This is a, a, a conversation that, uh, I, first of all, I want to thank Tavi for making the introduction and, and the contact. So Tavi Costa from Crescat Capital. How are you, Tavi? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Look forward to this conversation. Um, I'm grateful that uh, Jim was able to join us and look forward to this. And Jim Bianco from Bianco Research, president and founder of Bianco Research. We're going to talk about central banks, interventions, financial markets. And Jim, thank you very much for accepting this invitation. Yeah, thank you, guys. I look forward to the conversation. All right. So we have so much to talk about, about all that is happening in financial markets, especially with regards to central banks interventions. And the one question that I want to start off uh, for you, Jim, so we can kick off this conversation is the following. So the crisis triggered by the coronavirus, do you think it exposed our financial system fragilities or it caused them? Well, that's a good question. And I'd have to probably go with expose them. Um, we were running a financial system on a certain set of assumptions that did not anticipate some kind of a pandemic type global shutdown. And once we got that, it did show the, you know, exposed it. Even if you were to narrow that down a little bit, I think there's been an argument to be made that it's exposed a lot of business practices too, like the incessant buybacks and the leveraging of companies that they never were holding amount of money that they needed to as a rainy day fund if they were to ever run into trouble. And now there's a need to have to bail out those companies. So I'd probably lean towards more exposed it, although you know, you could make a good case that it caused it as well too. It's a tough question to answer, to be honest with you. Tavi, if you want to add anything, please uh, feel free. I'm having issues here. Apparently it's security is, is it'll let you guys continue. There. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, I don't know what's going on, one sec. But, uh, okay, great. So one thing that I was, uh, I've been paying attention for a long time uh, regarding the Fed's actions and policies is that since September last year, so 2019, when the first liquidity crisis uh, happened in the financial system in the US, the Fed started intervening heavily, reducing rates, uh, incrementing the, the overnight repos and That to me suggested that something was not right or some fragilities or maybe it was the business cycle coming finally to an end after 10 years of expansion. And the coronavirus was, as you said, the, the sudden stop of economics, sudden stop economics that caused that, that made it, made it the whole thing even worse. But if you weren't for the coronavirus, do you think we, could end up, even without the coronavirus, we could have a recession, even without that? Yeah, I do think that there was a real possibility that that could have happened. What um, what you're talking about happened in September. Let me put some, some color on that. Sure. Um, in the post-crisis, during the crisis of 2008, we correctly identified that the banking system over-levered itself. Overlevering itself means that the banks had a certain amount of equity and then they could give out loans and buy securities above that in multiples above that. In the case of Lehman Brothers, they went from $1 of equity to $40 worth of securities. That we decided was too much. So we've put together a myriad of rules over the last 12 years to pull back the banks. Uh, and those rules are not just Federal Reserve rules. Those are Bank of International Settlement rules. There's a Basel III. <clears throat> Those are FDIC rules. Those um, are European banking rules, ECB rules, all the way up and down the line. So we limited what banks could do in terms of leverage. 
You get to September of 2019, and the markets had been growing and growing and growing. Bank assets had not been keeping up. They hit their limit as to what they could do. And that's when you started seeing problems in the repo market. The Fed came in with a patchwork. And that patchwork was to hand the banks extra reserves to try and keep that market going. And it worked for a while. And then the coronavirus hit. But I do think your larger point is right. Where were we before the coronavirus? We were in year 12 of an expansion. We were showing serious signs of strain in that expansion. And that's one of the reasons why I've pushed back on these arguments about, well, let's look at what happened to the financial markets during the Spanish flu or during the Hong Kong flu in the 60s or during SARS or MERS or the bird flu or the swine flu. A lot of those came in very different environments. The Spanish flu came literally at the end of World War I, completely different financial, financial system environment. SARS, two days after the Iraq war started in 2003 was when SARS was declared a pandemic. Markets were down, risk was, was high, people were very defensive. Then you declared a pandemic. You got a completely different response out of markets than what you had here, the 12th year of the longest recovery ever, raging markets going, signs of strain that you would see at a peak, and then you got the coronavirus. So that's why I think that this is giving a much different response than those did in the in the in the past. Guys, I'll, I'll sorry about that. That was a security guard was uh, uh, just telling us uh, uh, some giving just giving us some information about the building. But I have uh, they're not going to take you away, are they? No, 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 no one is in the building. That's what's funny. Uh, I'm, I'm probably <laughs> the only one here. So, um, but I would like to share a uh, a chart with you first to. Uh, to then um, uh, perhaps um, perhaps uh, you can you can comment on those charts. Uh, let's see here. So just share my screen. One minute. All right. So can you see it? Yes. All right. So uh, my first question to you is 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 regarding you know the this environment that we're in in, in terms of the macro uh, economic setup in general. Um, uh, the, what are the, the industries that you see, the, the sectors or, or assets? It can be even an asset class that can benefit from this sort of QE to infinity lunacy that we're, we're hearing recently. Um, more recently, as you see in this chart, uh, S&P 500, you remember when everyone was saying that it was supposed to be highly cor or positive correlated to, uh, to the Fed balance sheet. And then we saw this correlation completely break. This chart should be updated because there is a relief bounce more recently, but also there, there is a, a massive increase in, in the balance sheet even from there. Uh, one, one industry that I've been focusing on, and I would like you to comment on that if you, if you have any views on it, that perhaps could benefit from this, is the only industry I know that is still trading below the 1980s. Uh, levels and at the same time it is likely to probably um, uh, benefit from this whole environment. So maybe perhaps you could uh, you could give us your view on 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 what you think about about those those two charts and, and maybe something you're seeing on that. Sure, and uh, if I could, I'll I'll comment on those charts. If you could show my screen, I want to show a couple of charts that are along that screen. Um, you showed the Fed balance sheet. Uh, let me just get there. And here's the Fed's balance sheet updated, and I can draw on the screen here. Uh, and you can see that it's really taken off to new all-time highs is what's happened with the Fed balance sheet. As a percent of GDP, the Fed's balance sheet right now is at 24%, almost a quarter. It should take out its all-time high set in 2014 as well. But I also wanted to point out, let's not just look at the Fed. Let's look at world central banks. So if we include all of them, the Fed, the ECB, the Bank of England, the Bank of Japan, and the Swiss National Bank, their balance sheets are up a trillion and a half dollars in just the last month or so, taking out their old high from 2018. And a way to express that is, here is this aggregate size of the bond market right here. Here's the aggregate size of all those balance sheets. They now own 31% of the bond market up from 27% just a month ago, and their all-time highs of 33% should probably fall in the next couple of months. The amount of stimulus 
that central banks are putting into this system is unprecedented. Deutsche Bank says it's 30 trillion annualized is what they've committed to. That's larger than the, the capitalization of the stock market. We passed a $2 trillion stimulus bill on Friday. Two hours ago, Donald Trump was saying he thinks it's time they start another $2 trillion infrastructure stimulus bill. I think that what you're going to see in terms of assets is we're going to have a V bottom and that V is going to be in the second or third quarter where we have all the layoffs and the contraction of the economy. The virus will go away. We'll rebound. I don't think we're going to go all the way back to the high. That's your L. And on the backside of that, we're going to have inflation. Or as I've even joked about, if we don't have inflation, if the Fed could run their balance sheet, which is five and a quarter now, the estimates are it'll be 10 within a year. If the central bank, world central banks can run theirs to 25 or $30 trillion, and we could get those balance sheets up at new records, and we don't have inflation, then we could delete the word from the dictionary. Because if this doesn't <laughs> produce inflation, yeah. nothing will produce inflation. So I think that the play here is, for now, you're going through a contraction. Nominal GDP is going to contract. Stock market's going to struggle, I still think. Um, but when we start seeing the peak in viruses and coming out of it, stimulus is going to be the order of the day. And that should produce inflation. And I think that all the inflation beneficiaries will go. If it doesn't initially, they'll just keep doing $2 trillion a year, $2 trillion, $2 trillion until it does uh, as well. To your question about gold, that has been one of the more confounding things that I think has been gold. In theory, gold should be going ballistic. It's not going ballistic. One of the reasons I think it's not going ballistic is too much. The purpose of gold is to get your money out of the financial system, but too much of it is being purchased within the financial system. It's GLD, it's futures contracts, it's derivatives on gold. Fine, you buy gold because you think there's going to be stress until you find out that your counterparty has failed and you don't get your money, and then you might as well have just owned Tesla stock then at that point. The way you need to own it is physical gold. The premium that the physical gold is getting over the COMEX price is near a record and there's shortages galore. So I do think that eventually gold will make a run. But I think that the structural problems is it's not GLD. It's not futures. It's go buy gold coins and put them in your basement. And a lot of people don't want to do that or don't know how to do that. And even if they have the motivation to do that, you call up a coin dealer, they don't have any. So that's going to take time. It'll eventually come with gold. But I do think that that mentality has to change. I, I just want to go back to, to Jim's point about central bank's balance sheets uh, skyrocketing uh, across the globe. And with all these stimuli, stimulus uh, packages, not only monetary, but also fiscal, the we, we might not have price inflation in the sense of goods and services like the CPI or the PCE. But if all this money creation by the Federal Reserve keeps going directly to financial markets, it might only inflate again financial assets unless this two trillion uh, fiscal bill, stimulus bill actually gets the money to the people. So if the people start spending, I think we can see inflation even faster than people uh, realize. Uh, can I just jump in on that real quick? Of course. Not only um, last uh, over the weekend, Donald Trump made a comment that the way that they're trying to do this stimulus is um, uh, the the way they're trying to do this stimulus is that they're they're trying to get it out in the market in a matter of days. And if they don't get it out in days, he said, Congress is going to come back and they're going to change the rules so that they're going to get it out in days. The way they're doing it now is they're saying to all the thousands of banks in the world, uh, you hand out the loans and we'll reimburse the banks. But if you don't get that money out in days, we'll just have the government do it. So I think they're damn well intent on making sure this money gets out there and making sure that this money gets spent. And it gets spent as quickly as possible uh, as well. So I 100% agree with you that 
one of the things that may happen is, is that this money may never make it into the economy, but boy, they're going to move heaven and earth to try and make it, it get this money into the economy to make sure that it does go. Just before uh, uh, switching to, to Tavi, just one, one uh, additional point there is if, if the Fed or if the, the, the Congress, if Congress doesn't make it, doesn't, cannot make the money get to Main Street, uh, what happens uh, in the case of the Federal Reserve uh, printing the money and getting, and getting the banks to making all the loans there? If I just l let me re rephrase it. The way I see it is that right now we have, because of the coronavirus, we have a huge supply shock. We also have a huge demand shock. So we could say those two effects, they offset each other, and that's why we're not seeing price increases. But on the other hand, even if the Fed gets the money to the Main Street, if Congress make, makes uh, the money get to the people, get to the people, we might even have a higher demand for money. So people are seeing all, everything that is happening and say, well, I might as well just increase my liquidity needs and hoard this cash and not spend it. So we might be in a situation that even with the money getting to the street, people will not spend it. Do you think that's possible? Oh, I definitely think that that's possible, that they, 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 they won't spend. We don't know how they're going to react with this money, um, but we do know that the amount, the scale of the money that they're committed to, which is $6 trillion, which is 25% of the economy, which we've never seen before, is unprecedented the amount of money that we're going to see at least at least committed but you're right <clears throat> ultimately you want people to use this money and buy cars and buy houses and do things other than buy groceries and cleaning supplies and that's going to be tough to get somebody in this environment i don't know how somebody's going to buy a house in this environment most people won't even let you in their house because of the fear of the virus to actually look at it to actually buy it I don't know anybody who's going to want to go to a car dealership to buy a $30,000 car. I don't even know if the car dealership's open. And again, I don't know if they're even going to let me test drive it without me having to be sitting in a hazmat suit. So you're right. That money's going to be there. And great. I'll go buy some groceries with it. And I'll go buy some disinfectant wipes. But, you know, am I, am I going to buy serious things with it to really get the economy moving? That's going to take some time. But I do think that's why I said on the backside. When the virus peaks and it starts going down and we start returning back, that's when I think we could really start to see the burst of the money. So I don't think you're going to see inflation in March or April or May, but in the fall is when you could definitely start seeing it. In the fall, when we start going back to work, assuming that, you know, that we start having some return to normalcy, we've stuffed everybody with money, vacations, cars other things that they could spend their money on uh, along those lines, then you could start seeing it. And then maybe we'll start seeing that inflation. Tavi, you can jump in. Yeah, let me make a comment. So uh, first of all, one thing I've, I've, I've been looking at for some time, and I, I think it would be interesting for comment on that too, uh, but it's it's uh, one major reason why I think we haven't seen inflation yet is because of the, the commodities market. When you look at the commodities market since the 08 or so, uh, most commodities are either down significantly or flat. Um, you know, you can mention many, you know, oil, uh, net gas, agricultural commodities, um, the list goes on and on. And I think that that had, uh, you know, it, it's, it's very, it's, it's a little bit difficult to see inflation in such a low uh, commodity prices environment. Uh, the number one, maybe you can comment on that too. But also in terms of intervention, especially on the side of, of, of the government, um, one of the biggest questions that I've been trying to ask myself here is, is who is going to, to bail out whom? Um, you know, we're, we're seeing now no earnings essentially in, in corporations right now. Uh, corporate earnings are probably going to be plunging. Uh, we have no consumption as much as we had in the last few uh, quarters or so. So in terms of tax revenues, you know, it's going to be very challenging. And then you have the government spending side that is surging, uh, as you know. And, and at the same time, you have uh, economic activity that is falling to pieces. Um, and 
you know, I think the deficits, uh, it's, it's probably uh, somewhat obvious if you look at relative to GDP, deficits relative to GDP are probably likely to rise significantly here. Um, uh, well, you know, do you have any estimates, first of all, for uh, deficits relative to GDP uh, in your firm, in your opinion? Also, what are, what are the impacts of that in the short term? Yeah, if you look at deficits to GDP, um, right now the deficit at one trillion, the the old deficit at one trillion dollars, is estimated to be somewhere around four percent of GDP. The estimates I've seen are now that it was eighteen percent is where we're going, so that's putting it at around four or five trillion dollars the deficit as we move forward. And then Trump today said, "Let's do another two trillion on top of that." That deficit would be the highest in American history, except for 1944, when we were financing the uh, for financing World War II. These numbers are going to be out of sight. I like I said, we're going to look back at a trillion dollar deficit in a year or two, and we're going to think that's a balanced budget is where we're going to go with 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 these deficits. They're going to be huge in terms of 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 where we're going from here. So much so. Well, let me let me um, let me uh, turn tact here. If you could throw my screen back up here a, a second, I want to point out something here. Uh, the chart you're looking at here is the Fed's QE purchases. Um, this is the amount of money that the the way the Fed works is that they they say we're going to buy some bonds. Here's a list of bonds we're going to buy. Street, please submit us bids. Okay, they get about a hundred billion dollars worth of bids. How many bonds do they buy? That's the green line. They're buying $70 billion of bonds a day. A day is what they're buying. They used to do QE Infinity, and that was 85 a month. They're also doing 30 or so billion a day in mortgages. In other words, what I'm leading up to here is that if you look at this yield, this is the 10-year yield. Here's where it is today. Here's where it was a month ago. It really hasn't gone anywhere. The Fed is buying half a trillion dollars of bonds a week. Yields, the 10-year yield should be zero in this market if there was any normalcy to it. The reason I think it's going sideways right now is that we are worried about A, inflation, and B, giant deficits. I like to say I started in the bond market in 1987, 33 years ago. For 33 years, I've heard people say to me, well, we're going to have these big budget deficits and we're going to crowd out. The government's going to have to borrow so much money that we're going to see interest rates go up. They're going to crowd out everybody else. And for 33 years, I said, that's not a thing. It doesn't work that way. But coming out of this virus and coming at the numbers that we're looking at, that actually might be a thing. So really what you could wind up having is the fear of inflation after everything is behind us. There'll be a contraction first. The amount of stimulus that we're seeing right now, um, now leading to gigantic budget deficits and huge supply, you could see interest rates soar on the back end of this. Not in the middle of the crisis, not in the second quarter or third quarter. They'll maintain their safe harbor status. But coming out of this, you could see much higher interest rates. If I get back up to the early part of your question about commodity prices not moving, a lot of that's China. China is the is the factory of the world. Copper, iron ore, you know, aluminum, crude oil, all that stuff goes into China, out comes finished goods. China is trying to restart their economy. We could debate where they are, but they're not all the way back. And now China's customer, the rest of the world, is in lockdown. So a lot of the commodity depression you're seeing right now is largely because China can't get restarted to the degree they want. And even if they did and they start making iPhones, all the Apple stores are closed. No one's buying them right now. Now, maybe later this year they'll start buying them, but that's later this year. And then they'll have an inventory to work off. So I think that's why you're seeing the depression um, in commodities as well. But eventually, as we get going, if we start to see the inflation come, you'll start seeing more traditional inflation measures like some of those commodities, like gold and silver, start moving higher. I just want to ask, um, what role does, does oil play into all this? Because I've heard the thesis 
that we might have not only negative interest rates, but also negative oil prices. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Well, Fernando, can I actually, since you're of asking course. the question, um, I would like to share a few charts on that and have Jim comment on oil. Uh, that I think these are charts that I'm looking at. I'll be prob probably, can you see it now, my, my screen? All right. So uh, these are probably charts that I'll, I'll be tweeting maybe today. Um, and um, what's interesting here is when you look at this, you know, one, one thing that is, is being crazy is the contangle right now and the, and the future curve. You can see there in the second panel of this chart, largest contangle ever for the six month out uh, contracts. And you can see that how previous times when we had this distortion, it also uh, marked some major turns in oil prices. Um, I see this as well, sort of a double bottom oil relative to the S&P 500 or overall equities. Um, also doing a, a double bottom here as well. And you, you can see that uh, previous times like the tech bubble, this was actually in 1998 and oil was up massively after, after we reached that level. Um, you have the credit spreads in, in red here for energy uh, reaching extreme levels while oil prices have been declining. Well, it makes sense, but this divergence is kind of extreme now. Uh, you got oil prices versus a 200 day moving average also at an extreme. Uh, looks like we're in the depth of the, the global financial crisis. Uh, and you tweeted this that that um, um, uh, Fernando was just referring to, which is, you know, uh, Aramco will, will pay you to take oil. Uh, and analysts are saying that it's possible that we'll see negative oil prices. And at what point, uh, so I'll go back to my screen, at what point, um, you know, do we see a, a turn in oil and and what is your view on oil in general? Well, I think what's happening with oil right now is that the Saudis are using this crisis to try and achieve oil dominance. They are glutting the market with oil to a degree that we haven't seen before. Their hope is to break the Russians, to break the Iranians, who they hate, to break the frackers in the U.S., and they could become then the dominant player in this. So there's a secondary story in addition to everything else. So their the supply, we're getting a supply shock um, and a demand shock in oil that's a little bit different. The demand shock, because we're not using it as much because the global economy is slowing, and they're flooding the market with oil. If you could share my screen. <clears throat> um, by the way, your contango chart that's huge, it's betting that in six months, demand comes back. And the Saudis stop pumping like crazy. That's what you're seeing that they're trying to see this. Now, as far as negative oil goes, this chart here, I tweeted this out yesterday, but it's got a bunch of a bunch of different um, uh, uh, grades in, in North America. Now, remember that oil trades in net, you know, you buy oil and it will trade. Different grades are better grades than other grades. Um, so this implied bitumen spot that's trading at $1. There is actually an oil grade that's trading at $1. It comes out of Western Canada because 30% of it is what's called condensate. When, when you buy a barrel of oil, 30% of it's not oil. So that's why it trades at such a discount to everything else. And it requires extra processes when you get it to the refinery to do something with it. And then it also has to trade net of its transportation costs and its storage costs. So if transportation costs are expensive because it goes by rail, not by pipe, and if storage is running out because we've got such a glut and storage becomes higher, if the transportation and storage costs on some of these lower grade oils, like the $1 bitumen spot or the back in Guernsey, that's in um, North Dakota, or if in the Western Canada Select, which is at $4, that's the oil sands. If those transportation and stuff goes above $4, these will all trade at negative prices. We've seen this with natural gas. The scream you will hear in the distance will be Calgary and Edmonton because they are the oil parts of Canada that have been doing very well. And if they're going to have to continue to sell oil at $4 to $1 a barrel and it's going to go lower, there's going to be widespread bankruptcies all over the province of Alberta. It's going to be ugly. It's going to be ugly there right now. But keep in mind, there's a secondary story here. The Saudis are pumping like mad because the Saudis want to break everybody and go back to being the dominant player. They're tired of having the fight with the shale producers in the United States, with the Russians, with the Iranians, as to who sets the price in the dominance of oil. 
MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, he wants to be the man in oil and he's using this opportunity. So that end, that how do we get a resolution to this? You know, I know Trump is talking to all these sides. I don't know how he finds a, a way that everybody can declare victory and then stop pumping oil like crazy. So I think this is going to stick around for a while, what's happening with the, with the price of oil. Interesting. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Tavi. Go ahead. Uh, no, I, I think that's a that's an interesting view. Um, uh, and uh, but it, you know, related to uh, you know, obviously the real question is how much of that is priced in or or not. Um, but uh, in terms of what's happening with equity markets and economy deteriorating uh, overall, you know, how much do we need to see of a deterioration until we see some large institutions in general to uh, to start fail. Um, um, you know, we, we've had a, a few issues with the ETFs uh, outflows recently, which is that whole passive investment bubble. Um, that is, you know, my view at some point will be will cause issues. You have the, those, you know, large amounts of, of risk parity strategies all, all over the world uh, with people long equities and long uh, bonds. And if, you, if your equity part of the book is, is losing money in a significant way, uh, while your fund is underperforming, now you're under uh, facing challenging uh, moments for redemptions. Um, so, you know, what what is your view in terms of those those pillars of of, of the markets today? And and do you think that how much do we need to go down here more in not just the markets but also the economy uh, before we see you know you know Boeing or or some hotels some um uh, you know, some airline industries um are starting to really have issues and, ju and just in addition to Tavis Costa uh, to Tavis question is despite all the liquidity being injected by the Fed the ECB and other central banks the LIBOR OIS spread it keeps rising so i mean that that says something is not yet right yeah, I agree. There is there is a lot of that. Let me take these one at a time. If you put my screen up, um, here's a chart of viruses in the United States. And, um, and I did this chart uh, yesterday. And I want to point out, the reason I did this is I want to remind everybody, today's the last day of the month. The last day of the month, uh, February 29th, there were 70 cases, 70 in the United States. There was one death. On the 29th, we were at 142,000 and 2,400. Today, we're at 170,000, and we're at 3,400 deaths. Where are we going to be one month from today? If we've gone from 70 to 170,000 and won the 3,400 this month, and everybody says that next month, in terms of viruses, could actually wind up being worse, <clears throat> where do we wind up going? You tell me how bad this gets. I'll tell you how much damage, long-term damage, we do to the economy. Because we all want to talk about how many people are going to lose their jobs in April, how many people are going to lose their jobs in May. Then the virus will peak and everybody will go back to work. But not everybody's going to go back. There's going to be some long-term changes. Stephen Major, HSBC, has argued the handshake is gone. We will never do handshakes again. It makes sense. And if we have that kind of cultural change, we're going to have a lot of changes going on in, in our economy. So how much bad, how much worse is it going to be? So the next chart I'm going to throw up here at you. Uh, let me find my, um, I know where it is. All right, right there. <clears throat> this is my um, drawdown chart. So what it shows here is it shows a bunch of indices. So it starts here on January 1st at zero. The S&P is 20% off of its high. That's the S&P right there at the top. All of these other ones right here are financials. They're all these financials. JP Morgan is down 28%. The bank stock index is down 38%. In other words, the financials have done far worse than the overall market. I argued last week at the lows when the financials were down 50% and Citibank was down 56% right here at these lows. We were not at a financial crisis but damn close to one at that point. And that the market was signaling to us that there is a real possibility that we could be seeing a financial crisis. Here's your LIBOR treasury spread, the old TED spread. It has blown out to at least a 10-year high. 
This is saying that there is a tremendous amount of stress in the financial system. I agree that what Bernanke said, we're not going to see a major failure because we were at the limit. The Fed threw everything at the market. I've argued they've nationalized the markets in the way that they've done this. They lifted us off the lows for now, for now. But if we sink back to those lows over the next several weeks or make a lower low, we could be seeing some kind of a, of a, of a stress point that can lead to some kind of failure or some other type of problem. So my message here is financial failure now, no, but we are close. And there is definitely signs that the market is being bent real hard. Will it break? It doesn't have a lot more left to bend on it right now. For now, we're not bending it anymore because we've lifted off of those levels. But we are at a real risk point here. But if banks fail or if, we, if the financial stress gets worse, what else is left for the Fed to do? besides nationalizing a bank? No, well, that's exactly what they would do. They would do. They would take out the old 2008 playbook and they'd call up J.P. Morgan and say, buy Bear Stearns or buy WAMU. Or they'd call up some, or they would, or they would turn to Bank of America and say, you are now merging with Merrill Lynch. And that's what they essentially did. They forced all of those mergers. They forced all those mergers together as well. You would see more of that happen along the way as well. I think, though, what they would probably do at, a, at an interim step is they'd say, what is causing the problem here? And that is falling markets. Well, the Fed, if I just go back to my screen here again, uh, the Fed has put together all of these facilities that uh, primary deal credit facility, commercial paper funding facility, you can read the list yourself. How is this work? because the Fed's not allowed to do any of this. And the answer is the Fed is not buying corporate bonds. The Fed, although they committed to buying ETFs, fixed income ETFs that own investment grade bonds, they're not doing it. The treasury is doing it. They are putting for each one of these facilities, they are putting together a fund called the special purpose vehicle the treasury will commit money to that fund and be at what they call a first loss position. Now, that's a bunch of high finance talk for something very simple. The treasury will own the fund, not the Fed. The Fed will provide the financing, and then they hired BlackRock to do the trades. So the Fed is going to just finance the treasury. The government is buying corporate bonds. The government is buying ETFs. The government is buying commercial paper. The government is backstopping, providing loans against provincial paper. The Fed is just giving the financing. If these markets sink down lower, they'll buy all of it. They'll just ratchet up the purchases that they'll just try and single-handedly support those markets at higher levels to prevent that financial crisis. So instead of waiting for the firms to fail, they'll say the assets that the firms own that are falling, we're going to stop them from going down. Now, my fear of this is that long term, this is a problem of nationalizing markets. You reduce the market signal. Look, capital markets work because we watch markets. They give us signals. They give us ideas on where we're supposed to allocate our money. If you remove that and you're going long term, if you remove that, you wind up with distorted signals, malinvestment, which is bad investment, and Private sector players, funds and, and, and the like, they can compete against somebody that's got unlimited money that can write a number on a check and it doesn't matter to them. They leave and they make the problem worse. So in theory, what the Fed has done now, okay, you're trying to stop the liquidity problem now. But if you stay there long term, it's a real problem. Last thought for you on this thing. We did this in 2008. Not all of this, not to this degree, but we did a version of this in 2008. And then we didn't understand it. And we said, Ben Bernanke, you're the guy who came up with this. You run this. And Bernanke said, okay, we're going to do this for a little while. We're going to get out. And we did. 12 years later, 
We understand these programs. We understand it's the government buying, not the Fed. The Fed's the financier. We have a president who blames the Fed that the Dow's not 10,000 points higher, who wants negative interest rates, who wants the Fed to go hog wild with all their uh, with all of their financial engineering. We just gave him the tools to the Fed's printing press to do exactly that. We have merged the Fed and the Treasury as one. And the Treasury can now dictate to the Fed what to do. Donald Trump can dictate to the Fed what he wants. The question you have to ask yourself is, will he show some restraint in an election year when he's trying to get elected? I think I just answered the question right there. It's an election year. You've given him a printing press to try and ramp markets higher to get reelected. I think we know where we're going to go with this. Unless somebody else, a Mnuchin, a Powell, really stand at the doorway and say, absolutely not, even if you want to fire me, not going to let you do it. So we'll see where this goes, but it's a dangerous game that we're playing by nationalizing these markets through the government with the Fed being the financier. Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> I know, so I know, much. I'm just such no, a, I, I know, I'm, I'm a Johnny rain cloud here. Uh, there's so much know, to unpack there. It's, yeah. it's, but I mean, this, the one, the one point you hit the nail on the head because we're talking about price discovery. And the prices, they do provide the signal, especially in the financial markets, especially in interest rates. And if the Fed is suppressing this, I mean, we can really have long-term damage. In a way, I think this is what, what already happened because of the 2008 and 2009 and QE 1, 2, and 3. We already have had, have had some of that. But we might we might have even worse in the upcoming years. So that's and how do we unwind this? How do we go about really reducing the Fed's balance sheet, really increasing normalizing rates? It seems impossible. We tried to do this in December, uh, in in 2017 and 2018. I'm gonna share my screen now. Hold on, here. This is the net unrealized gains or losses of the large large chartered co commercial banks in the US. So these are the securities uh, held for sale, available for sale. So this shows us how the banks could not take higher interest rates back in December 2018. These were huge potential losses in the financial system. Now, given that we are already back to zero interest rates, and the Fed is intervening way more, it's going to become ever more impossible to unwind this. So where does this lead us? Well, that's a good question. I think, uh, you know, I'm looking at some of the um, uh, the comments here. Stop the bailouts. Let them fail. Uh, careful about that. That's not a walk in the park, you know, to let all these firms blow up. I mean, you might, you might like that from a... Um, an emotional standpoint, yeah, screw those bankers, but you might not like the consequences of that. I think what the where the Fed is right now, where the Treasury is right now, is everything we're doing will pose a challenge post-virus. We got to get post-virus. That's where they want to be. They want to be post-virus for starters, and then we can then start dealing with this. But make no mistake, post-virus won't be a walk in the park. I think it'll be inflation is what, they, is what they're going to wind up having us deal with as well. And we'll have to see what other problems we have, but it's not going to be e easy. One of the reasons that the market went down as much as it did, as I like to say, I don't think the market's panicked in the last six weeks. I don't think that the, what I think happened was they came to a realization that there was January 2020. And there was a set of assumptions we used in how the world worked. Then we saw the virus and we said, send all those assumptions to the history department. The world doesn't work that way anymore. There's a new reality in the world. We have to reprice to it. Markets don't complain. They don't explain. They just say, it used to be 100 and now it's 75. And we're not going to argue with you about whether it should be 98 or 97. It's just 100 to 75 is what we would what basic what we've been doing. And we've been yelling, stop, don't do that. And the Fed's been yelling, stop, don't do that, and trying to prevent it. And I think that ultimately they can't over a long period of time. They can for a little while stop it. 
But that's what we're doing is we're repricing. And part of that repricing is the post the post virus world is going to have problems too. Now, maybe what they're saying is, Jim, you're right. We're going to go from 100 to 75. But if we had done nothing, we'd go from 100 to 40. And that would make it much worse. I, you know, I could go either way on that argument. But I do think that what we're doing is we're going to a new era. We're going to something different. I think all those people say, got to buy the dip, you know, that we're going to come back. We're going to be stronger than ever. That's mean reversion mentality that nothing has changed and that we're going to go right back to where we were before. That's possible. I just don't think it's likely. I think we're going to have a different world. And in that different world, it's going to be lower valuations is where we're going to be. Last offering on that. In 1980s, we had an emerging market crisis, but it didn't hit the developed world. So the developed world could sit there and say, hey, you guys in the emerging markets, don't overreact. In 2008, we had, an market, we had a crisis that hit the major countries of the world, but the emerging markets could say, hey, you guys in the developed world, don't overreact. 2020, it's everybody. There's no one's immune from this right now. So if we decide that there's a new era and we have a different valuation, the Europeans are going to say, you're wrong on that. They got hit as bad as us. The Asians are going to say, you're wrong on that. They got hit as bad as us. So everybody's in the same boat as well. And that's what's different. I don't think that what we ever encountered or ever considered was all the crises we've had before hit the emerging markets, hit the developed markets, hit some of the developed markets, hit sectors. But we never had something that hit everybody. And this is something that hit everybody. And that's why I think you're seeing such enormous efforts put by the central banks to try and stop this. There'll be problems on the back end. But what they think they're trying to do is, you know, stop it from being much worse right now. Uh, <laughs> I still have many questions here. I, I want to be sensitive to your time, Jim. If we can still go on for a few more minutes. Yeah, we could go on for a few more minutes. I just hope no one's Great. committing suicide here. You know, <laughs> I do think that, you know, let me just say a quick positive. Look, we're, sure. ingenious, we, we have, we're ingenious people. We're creative people. We will adapt to the new environment. That's not a problem. But if we're going to sit around, you know, you know, sheltered at home going, when can we, when is the S&P going to go back to 3,400? And when can I just start screaming, there is no alternative. Get back in the stocks all the time for 100%. It's a different era. That era is over. We're going to go to a different era. It's not going to be the end of the world, but it is going to require us to be flexible in our thinking and in our changing. I think the thing that's going to happen coming out of this is we're not going to go back to work and say, great, now that I'm back at work, um, what company can I close now and move their operations to China? No, it's going to be, what can I close in China and move back to the United States? What can I close in China and move to Europe or to move to Brazil? We're going to go that way. So that's going to be a different way to think. So whenever I see on financial television all these people talking about the virtues of globalization, uh, that, that era ended about, about two months ago, in that we're in a different era. There won't be no globalization. There's just going to be a different type. And we can't cop trying to force January 2020 on us. We have to go to the new era. It won't be the end of the world. It's just it needs to be different. Tavi, but go, go ahead, ahead. Get another question. <laughs> I'll, I'll comment on a few things you said, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, well, sounds like, well, the nationalizing situation sounds like China to me. <laughs> China's been in that path uh, for a long time. So is Brazil in, in, a, few, uh, in a few parts too. Uh, and it's sad. I hope, I personally, I hope we don't see that. Um, but, you know, kind of trying to put together what you, all, all the stuff you said, and one of the things you said, you know, this, this race to the bottom on oil prices in general, and then, you know, the situation with the virus outbreak getting worse, which probably is linked to the idea of uh, worse e macro indicators for the next month or so, uh, labor markets becoming, you know, another issue as well, more and more. Um, and then at the same time, you comment on on Donald Trump becoming the, the new leader of the of the Federal Reserve, <laughs> and um, which was probably the case before, but now more than ever. Uh, and with the, the, the special um, uh, the SPVs that you were coming on, um, is do you think it's possible? Number one question: Do you think it's possible 
that they can uh, reduce volatility to more of uh, normal levels. I understand you said low multiple. I'm talking about more volatility until elections. Uh, do you think that obviously that's the goal from the Trump's perspective or it seems to be the goal? Do you think it's even possible? In other words, will this liquidity be enough to um, to offset you know this this turmoil in the markets? Um, and uh, in terms of the globalization, uh, a comment you made, it's it's very interesting that you know I've I've, I've been thinking about that as well. And the largest companies in the world are from the U.S. Um, and if you're thinking about you know the logistics of coming back to the U.S. as well, you would think that that will be you know less globalization would cause less exports uh, among countries in general. Um, and, and that is a major source of dollars, you know, so, so there will be a lack of dollars outside of the U.S. Another reason why we're seeing repo markets now becoming inter, uh, international, not just in the U.S. So will that become an issue as, as we get into a world where, um, where it's more deglobalized in terms of the dollar now? So two separate questions, one on Trump and if he is able to reduce the volatility to normal and the second one on the dollar. Uh, the first question, um, no, we can't reduce the volatility. I, what will reduce the volatility is right now you need to get the markets to the point where they believe that we have now priced in this new era, that we're close to what we perceive as fair value. When that happens, private sector buyers will emerge. Funds will emerge. They will buy and hold. Right now, the only people that have merged in the last week are people that think I could buy spiders right now. They'll rally 15% in the next four days and I could sell it at a profit. There's not people saying this is the new reality should be priced here. And I want to own it for five years starting right now. When we get to that point, volatility will find some kind of equilibrium. The, the, the volatility we see now is a signal we're not at equilibrium. That's why if you, uh, if you uh, jump to my screen here again, I'll show you something real quick about uh, volatility. Um, let me just find the right chart here real quick. This chart here, um, what this shows you is, I know this is a little hard to read for some of you, but I'll explain it. These are the 20 biggest days in the stock market's history since 1926. The S&P 500, the 20 biggest days. This shows you what it's done the next 100 days. By the way, a couple of these days are this month. We've had a few of these days this month on this list. On average, 100 days later, the stock market is 18% lower. 70% of the time, the market is lower. What this chart here shows you on the bottom is we had a bunch of these days up here in 2008. That was here. By, February, by March of 2009, we were, as it says here, 40% lower. Whenever you see this kind of wild volatility, it means a market is not at equilibrium and that it most likely needs to go lower to find that equilibrium. And when it does, then the volatility goes away. Trump doesn't want to hear that. He wants to hear volatility goes away with the stock market back at 3,400, not volatility goes away with the stock market at 2,100 um, as well, too. But the only way we go back to 3,400 is if you think this is all going to be forgotten and we're just going to go right back to where we were in January. It's possible, like I said, but I don't, I don't buy it. So I don't think that the, the volatility we see, they, can't, they can suppress it for a little while, but not longer term. Only, a, only markets reaching what the collective wisdom thinks is fair value Real buyers start saying, I'll now own it at these prices because I think it represents the new reality's fair value. That that could definitely get us there, but we're not we're not there, we're not there yet uh, as well. And what was your second question? It skipped skipped my mind here, real quick. Yeah, no problem. That was related to the dollar in terms of the deglobalization, which is a, more of a, a macro trend, probably more in the medium to long term that you're referring to, perhaps, maybe even short term depending on a few companies uh, already getting out of China in terms of used to be the, uh, or it is still the manufacturing plant of the world, but I'm with you. I think it's going to change, but what's the impact of that on the dollar overall? Well, you know, I like to joke about the dollar that, you know, should the dollar remain being the reserve currency? 
And, I, and I've always said for years, the answer is no, it shouldn't be the reserve currency. But you show me an alternative. As soon as an alternative shows up to the dollar, it will stop being the alternative. The euro is not it. The yen is not it. The yuan is not it. Bitcoin or other cryptos may be in the future, might be it, but none of them are ready for prime time right now. So the reason the dollar is the reserve currency is it's a bad choice, but all the other ones are worse is, is why it stays it stays there. With the reduction of... Um, of globalization, not the elimination of globalization. That will never go away. You know, the Swiss will always make good cuckoo clocks and stuff like that. That that won't always go away. But things with the reduction of it, I do think you'll see less trade. You'll see less emphasis on the reserve currency as well. But uh, ironically, I think what it'll do is it will also lead to the dollar safe haven status. One of the reasons we have a shortage of dollars right now, everybody's demanding dollars. Because in this environment, and it's so uncertain, and there's so many problems, where do I hide my money? And the answer is, I don't know where, but it's going to start with a dollar-based investment. So everybody wants dollars. So you've got this, in, so all the currencies are falling, especially emerging currencies are falling, as people go into dollars right now. That in the post-crisis or, or the post-virus world will continue to be, it will continue to maintain its, its status. Now, as soon as we develop a crypto that looks like it could be a medium of exchange and a store of value, globally accepted, dollars done. But I just said that it might be 30 years before we find, it might be two years. But right now, like I said, if I could wave a wand and we all said, okay, the dollar is no longer the reserve currency. Fine. What is? Well, there's no good option. Then we're back to what's the worst What's the worst of all the – what's the least bad option? It's the dollar. And that's kind of where we're at with it right now. But I think what the administration has – or what the American public has to answer is you're not the reserve currency because you're good. It's because everybody else is worse. And as soon as somebody else comes in that's better, you're gone as the reserve currency. And like I said, that will probably be some crypto that is not created yet that's coming soon in the next couple of years that we don't even know what the name of it is, if I had to guess. But we're not there yet, so the dollar sticks around for a while as kind of the top dog. I have two final questions. I mean, I, I could go on for another hour here, but, <laughs> but we can't. Mm -hmm. But I have two final questions. First one, if inflation really picks up, how will the Fed deal with it? Will it just will it just change the narrative? Maybe oh now we can tolerate four percent inflation or six percent. This is good for business. And the other question is, uh, was there any other option to deal with the crisis even in 20, uh, 20, 2008, 2009, and now 2020? Besides this massive intervention and the unprecedented amounts of money creation, was there another option? And if you were there, and I understand you were interviewed for the job at the Federal Reserve Board, how would you have dealt with the crisis? Yeah, yeah um, on that last part first, that, that's, uh, that is public information that I did go to the White House last year and I did interview to be a Federal Reserve governor. Um, and then they picked uh, Chris Waller and Judy Shelton. I know both of them are fantastic picks. I was honored to be able to be considered. Uh, I, I, I got a chance to go to the West Wing of the White House on business. Not many people can say that. And it was, uh, it was a great uh, experience as well, too. So I'm happy that, uh, uh, that, that, they, that they did that. As far as your question goes about inflation, <clears throat> um, yeah, they'll tolerate more inflation. They will tolerate more inflation and um, they will just say, you know, the 2% target's now a 3% target. If interest rates go up too much, they'll try and QE them back down and they'll constantly manipulate the markets around the edge um, as well. But I think they'll consider that a victory. I think what they'll say is if later this year, 2021, the economy is recovering and there is inflation, Interest rates are going up. Markets are a little wobbly because interest rates are going up. Remember, higher rates, lower multiples. Um, you know, your PE ratio should come down. They'll say, that's a win. 
It's a win over everybody sitting at home, fearing that they're going to get sick and die. So that's that's a, they'll, they'll they'll think of it in those terms um, as well. The question about what I would do, well, I, I tell you what I do, and they throw me out of the room. Is you know I'll, I'll I'll say the two dirty words that you'll never hear a central banker say: trust capitalism. And I'll give you an example. Um, tomorrow. 81. Let me back up a second. The, the 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 ground zero. The fixed income markets are not in a good place right now. The ground zero of where they're not in a good place is the commercial mortgage market. In 2008, it was residential mortgages that blew up. Today, it's commercial mortgages. Why? Because I own a hotel and no one's in it, and I have to pay my mortgage on March 1st. I have to pay my mortgage on May 1st. I have to pay my mortgage on June 1st. I own a business and I own my rent and the government closed me and I own my rent. I own a mall or an office building and people have to pay me their leases, but they're going to fail because they're not in there doing business. So I'm going to come up short. To give you an example, there's a, a cheesecake factory is a, is a restaurant chain in the United States. Cheesecake factory last week announced they have hundreds of restaurants. They flat out announced. We're not going to pay our mortgage April 1st. Why? Our stores are closed. There's nobody in them. We're not generating any money. We're not going to pay our stores. $81 billion of mortgage payments, commercial mortgage payments, are due April 1st. $81 billion is due May 1st. If I was at the Fed, they'd say, this is a crisis. And I'd say, no, it isn't. Well, what do we do about it? Nothing. You tell all of those commercial mortgage owners... And you tell all of those in those restauranters, you guys got to get in a room and work something out. You got to work something out between you two guys. Uh, it's not for us to just bury you with money. Cheesecake Factory, you got a problem. Commercial mortgage owners uh, that own the mortgages on Cheesecake Factory restaurants, do you want to take the restaurants and run them? No, you don't. You don't know how to run restaurants. So talk to them and work something out. Trust capitalism. I tell you, I, I was in a debate many years ago with a former member of the Monetary Policy Committee at the Bank of England. And I said that, they said, what would you have done in 2008? And I said, a version of trust capitalism. And he pointed at me and he said, they will never do that. They will never do that. And I said, I know they will not do that. That's the problem. We constantly manipulate these markets. You know, there's some smart guys with mortgages and there's some smart people at Cheesecake Factory. Just let them alone, they'll figure it out. But we won't. We'll try and get in the middle and we'll turn on the printing press and we'll throw money at them and we'll say, OK, we made March better than it would normally have been. We made April better than it normally would have been. At what cost longer term? And that's the problem that we, we, we face right now. It's a mindset problem that we have more than anything else. Somebody said they're a bunch of socialists. Everybody's a socialist right now. That's the problem. Yeah, We're all exactly. about socialists. We're just arguing to different degrees. I'd argue to you, you get me cranked up here. You got MMT version 1.0 unfolding right now. That's what this is, is it's a version of modern monetary theory. Print money and fix everything. And if you don't produce inflation, we're going to print more money and fix more things. And we're going to print more money and make more stuff free until we go too far is what we do. So I kind of hope we get inflation sooner rather than later to fail this experiment sooner because we're going to keep going down this road. Oh, let's make college free. Let's make healthcare free. Let's make cell phones free. Let's make rent free. Let's make everything free um, at, at that point. You know, just call Jay, tell him to turn the printing presses on faster as well. That's the problem that we're, we're, we're going to face. And what stops that is you get inflation. You get markets that reject it. The sooner they reject it, the better. We'll see. Like I said, they're not going to reject it on the down. They're not going to reject it over the next several months because we're going lower. But when we come back on the upside, we'll see what kind of response we get out of that. Jim, uh, fascinating discussion. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your uh, candid and honest answers. I mean, this is what we need. And I, I think it's, it's a uh, one of the questions of our time, because this is going to impact everybody. 
not just the US, uh, it's the whole world, whatever it's being done there. It's even being replicated by other central banks, by other governments. And I think it's a, a, an experiment destined to fail. It has failed in the past. People, has, people have forgotten how it was. We have done monetary, modern monetary theory in Brazil many times in the 80s, in the 90s. I've experienced hyperinflation in my lifetime. I know how it is just to spend, to print and spend money. So it doesn't work. So I, I hope it does end rather sooner than later. Tavi, just your, your final words, and then I'll leave to Jim to say, say goodbye. Yeah, um, well, first off, it's it's uh, crazy to think about of uh, inflationary landscape, which I'm totally on board. It, it would truly change the the macro scenario in terms of you just think about the companies that would not be able to survive in such uh, uh, an environment. It's like the 1970s environment with much more debt on the corporate and government level. Uh, and that would be very difficult to uh, uh, to a lot of businesses. So I think that that, you know, that would truly change the whole landscape. But um, uh, on my last comment, I just want to say, well, thank you, uh, Jim, for uh, for putting the time with us, uh, we're you know I'm I'm big fan of your work. I think you were one of the the, the, the few guys in the industry that really put the work in terms of uh, being an independent thinker. A lot of people like to say that, and I, I think you truly are. Um, so congrats for that. And I um, you know I, I I looked at your stuff all the time. So thanks for sharing your views and and being with us. And Fernando. Uh, thanks as well for uh, for having me on as well. I, I'm uh, jo just asking questions today, and it was fun. It was my first time interviewing someone. So uh, thanks again. Well, thank you, guys. I appreciate the kind words, and uh, I thank you all very much. And I'll just leave you with the optimistic tone I would leave you with is it's going to be different, not necessarily bad. We got to not whine. I want January 2020 back again. It just it's going to be new and it's going to be a different type of environment. And we can go from A to B if we want to without it being painful. Um, and the part of the part of the problem with the bailouts and everything else is there seems to be an implicit demand. I want it to be back to the way it was pre-virus and I want it to stay that way forever, but it can't. And as soon as we recognize that it will be different, not necessarily bad. We go about getting there. It won't be nearly as, as, as painful as it has to be. And I hope we come to that recognition and we move along those lines as quickly as possible. But thank you very much. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you very much, Jim. Thanks, Tavi. All the best. Goodbye. Thank you.